Black Heritage, a history of Afro-Americans. Today's topic, new roles for black students. And the panel discussion, reflections of the old student movement. Today's moderator, William Strickland, writer, lecturer, and former director of the Northern Student Movement. Guest panelists, James Garrett, Professor of Creative Writing and Directing of the Black Studies Program, Federal City College, Washington, D.C. James Turner, graduate student of Northwestern University and a Ph.D. candidate in African Studies and Political Sociology, also chairman of the Afro Student Union. Linda Hush, a 1968 graduate of Spelman College, Atlanta and now a historical researcher and charter member of the Black People's Alliance of Atlanta University Center. Ray Brown, senior at Columbia University, majoring in history and on the executive board of the Students' Afro-American Society. And now your moderator, Mr. Strickland. On today's show, we're going to try and discuss some of the changes that have taken place in the student movement. Some of the changes that have caused a movement that began as an integrated movement to now divide largely along racial lines. The old student movement, the one with which most of us are familiar, began with an emphasis on morality. It began with an emphasis on <coughs> implementing the legal kinds of decisions which had been certified by the highest court in the land. It began, for most of us, I think, in Greensboro in 1961 with the movement of black students sitting in. Here we can see the students from North Carolina A&T College sitting in and the opposition of local whites in Greensboro. We can notice the American flag We can notice the police were calling for order in the situation. We notice now, seven years later, that black students are emphasizing different kinds of things. That they're talking about black education, they're talking about black universities, and they're concerned about rectifying some basic problems in American society that that older student movement had not confronted, had not felt or knew existed. What do you think are some of the changes that have taken place from 61 to 68, Jimmy? Um, I think the kinds of changes that um, you just uh, described, the, you know, the kinds of outlines that it has taken, I'd like somehow to speak to why I think the change has taken place, and then say something about what I, and I think by doing that I can say something about what the changes have been. I think basically, uh, northern students at the time that the, the civil rights thrust was taking place, I should say northern young people in the urban ghettos, were rather cynical and suspicious about the kinds of ideas that uh, pro were propelling that, mov that movement. That is the ones that you said, based upon morality, based upon the feeling that the laws that were in the courts could bring about a new way of life for blacks. And simply because they were living in the North, where these laws were already supposed to have been, you know, on uh, statutes. And um, so they didn't really feel that, uh, that that was going to bring any more change, real change toward the kind of things that black people wanted. Uh, secondly, I think, is that they were very critical because they thought that there wasn't anything that was fundamentally geared toward the interest of black people as a people, you know. It was always, black people were always submerged in this so-called, you know, white and black fraternity. And I think the other question was that blacks went down, they're not having any clear idea themselves, I mean, any full-blown kind of idea about what they wanted out of that uh, in a systematic way for the entire group. Now, I think the change that's taken place is that Blacks have, 
uh, black students now, having gone through this process, I think it was a necessary process, let me say that. I think it was necessary, and I think that um, that it was like, all, like a ladder, rungs on a ladder. In order for us to climb higher, we had to go through that experience. The change we've made now is to begin to question the basic foundation, the moral question, the moral assumptions of this society, the ideas, the political ideas that are supposed to uh, be legitimate. And uh, we're thinking more in terms of how uh, we can af affect change on the kind of education we get that will equip us to insert to service the black community as a whole and eventually go on to define our own political uh, destiny. Let me ask Jimmy Garrett, who was involved in the Freedom Rides and the sit-ins, whether it's true that when you were you simply caught up in, in the emotionality of the times. Uh, I remember I was involved in, as a high school student uh, with the NAACP in Boston, and they had a slogan in the late 50s, free by 63. What, what was your vision when you began to work in the student movement? I think that uh, vision uh, was broken down on two levels. First, I try to speak generally and then, then speak by myself. I think it was broken down along the Christian brotherhood, uh, love thy neighbor, uh, create a uh, community of love. And then on the other hand, on the social democracy, um, uh, those people who had the ideology, I guess, the political <coughs> ideology were geared more toward Bayard Rustin and uh, Michael Harrington's concept of uh, how America should be a social dem democracy, more welfare, poverty programs, which eventually became the program of the country, uh, uh, and it co-opted a great deal of the movement. And there was a debate that was going on in SNCC when I entered the SNCC um, and was working in Mississippi, broken down along those lines, that is, in, in terms of the black, the black staff that was represented. It was broken down along the lines of developing social democracy and uh, some kind of uh, halfway independent political organization. And on the other hand, the Christian morality, uh, the, the development of a sense that we have to prove to uh, the majority of the white people in this, in this nation that we are human beings. My own sense was more lean, more geared toward the uh, religious than it was toward the political. I was I only mean, in a, in a just strictly uh, Baptist and Methodist sense, but in the sense that I wanted also to prove to white people that I was a human being and as just as good as they were, assuming that they were the standard of goodness. And it took, uh, it took about a year, maybe a year and a half, <coughs> for me to get convinced that uh, that, uh, that wasn't even the question any longer. The question was one of uh, the day-to-day -day survival uh, when you're working there and trying to break the fear. That is, it was a fantastic amount of fear, fear that immobilized people. And you find yourself daily, instead of trying to prove to the white people that you were human beings, you had to continue to uh, put yourself out to show black people that, that uh, it was possible to do what you had to do and remain alive. So that the move toward the vote was, uh, most of, by that time, most people in SNCC knew that the vote wasn't worth anything. But that was <coughs> a mechanism by which they tried, one of the mechanisms by which they tried to break the fear, uh, particularly in the hardcore South, uh, Mississippi, eastern Alabama, southwest Georgia, and the rural areas. Uh, that was a very, very intense thing. I think, though, that today it's not a question of trying to not only a question of trying to challenge and question the basic assumptions of this country, I think that at least the vanguard of a major thrust of the student movement is geared toward um, developing county institutions, alternative institutions. And my own sense is to, in the process, just destroy the ones that exist. That it's a matter of complete and total annihilation of the white American system. I want to come back to that, but I want to, you said something interesting. The influence of people like Bayard Rustin and Michael Harrington on the early ideology of the student movement, uh, Linda's from the South. Did you have, had you ever heard of Bayard Rustin or Michael Harrington? What was your sense of, of the, the sit-ins and the freedom rides for you, when you during that time? Uh, well, between 1959, from 1959 to 1964, I was a little high school <coughs> student. Uh, very much at that time involved in oratorical contests praising America as a, as a nation where in I might find equality and, 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 and uh, equal opportunity and the like. I had never heard of a Bayard Rustin, um, a Michael Harrington. The only 
uh, symbolic figure that I did know about was Dr. King. Uh, I'm from Atlanta. He was from Atlanta. Uh, a, there's a historical association there. He went to Morehouse College and the like. Um, the, there was a strong student movement uh, at Atlanta University in the Atlanta University Center, the six colleges there. Uh, the, there, the, the students were very much involved in, in the protests, the sit-ins, the going to jail and all. But I, as a high school student, knew very little about this. So personally, I knew nothing about it. There was no real and uh, steadfast attempt to inform high school students uh, about what was going on right uh, maybe four or five blocks away from where my high school was and where the center colleges were. Uh, and the, the final impression, or the, uh, the major impression that I had uh, concerning the old student movement was that I was inspired not to, say, attend a, a, a good uh, black college, but to take advantage of some of these opportunities being opened and, and go to a white university where I could really get a so-called, you know, quote, good education. Uh, I, this was, I think, a part, it wasn't, a, a mon I had no monopoly on this. I think many blacks began to think this way, that in order to really get something good, we, it had to be white. Uh, this is what integration was deep down within us, was absorbing white culture because we had nothing of our own. We had nothing, so therefore, well, therefore, uh, integration was completely accepting what the whites have had. Uh, but one of the reasons I think uh, uh, that there was, has been a change uh, from a, a movement that was integrated oriented to one that has been divided along racial lines or another factor has, was an emerging uh, authenticity of black culture. Many, mm -hmm. many persons began to, to realize that we had something ourselves that, can't, that is legitimate and, that, uh, and for which we can be proud. There were the emerging black African nations uh, uh, throwing off colonialism and, and having many attitudes of anti-assimilationism. Uh, there was the influence of Brother Malcolm. Uh, all these factors were involved in, 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 in bringing about change. I assume you were a young scholar in New Jersey at the time. Um, I don't think that my experience was really typical. Um, I was involved with the NACP and CORE mm -hmm. at home. Um, and we were doing things like picketing Woolworths and White Castle and, and towards, I guess, 63, um, voter registration drives and things of this sort. And I think it's very true that, that the whole feeling was very much influenced by the liberal ethos. That is, there wasn't much question of, you know, whether institutions were relevant or useful or... And the, the only thing really people were talking about was just getting into them. That is, getting more students to go to white schools or whatever. And I think there was a lot of... Um, it was a very necessary stage, but there was a lot of thrashing about and not a real sense of, of doing anything that involved most people. I don't think the massive numbers of black high school students, for example, either, either those who went to predominantly white schools or who were in black schools, really got involved in this kind of thing. My sense of the situation is that, as I recall it, Negro students at that time were not defining themselves as black. Uh, that yep. most of us were felt that uh, it was just, as I <coughs> mentioned with the NAACP example, that the weight of, of white society was behind this moral, just movement, and that it would only be a matter of time until we were able to avail ourselves of the fruits of the society. I want to come back to... I just want to say, sure. the, the whole, there was also the implication that, that a very valid end for all of this was to somehow become completely involved all of the white institutions in this mm -hmm. society. And, and as an ultimate goal, that's pretty shoddy, mm -hmm. and pretty, and not very much. But I think it was necessary, because I don't think that without prolonged contact with these kinds of institutions that you can really help begin to develop analyses of how to deal with them, how to combat them, and what exactly makes them function. Let me see if <coughs> you're then suggesting that it was people's experience um, in the earlier struggle that caused them to understand some of the the falseness of the assumptions that they had. Well, th that was definitely my personal experience and from my observation very much the experience of the whole black student movement in, in the North because at the beginning 
the, the demands and the kinds of conversation were only about things like having more black students come in and just changing the curriculum. And, and, and now, of course, it's changed to criticizing of the relevance of these whole, the whole question of white educational institutions in general. Mm -hmm. And that's a change that I think has been brought about by the kind of the racist conduct of these, you know, of the administrations and the institutions that people have dealt with. I'd like us to talk for a moment, do some a critique of uh, an American institution. Brother Garrett earlier said that that SNCC had come to a position that the, that the vote was irrelevant. I think most people would would not understand what he what he meant by that. Especially, I think they would probably say, "Well, how can you say the vote is irrelevant uh, given the the political victories of?" of Dick Hatcher and Gary and Stokes and in Cleveland, the 11 legislators in, uh, in Georgia and the, the one legislator in Mississippi. How does, how does what appears to be progress uh, to most people, how does that prove out of your experience that the vote is irrelevant? Well, uh, it, it covers a lot of territory. I think that um, the, the problem is that when the whole idea of there being Hatcher and Stokes and Brooke uh, and, and Julian Bond is that it still projects a symbol that is possible to survive in this society, in this country, in this nation. All the, and, and it also proves that it's possible for this, this, that this nation, a, as fascist as it is in a lot of ways, is flexible enough to allow you certain kinds of uh, room for protest so long as you don't get too far out of hand, so long as you don't start moving to kill white businessmen, for example, uh, so long as you don't move to try to take care of, uh, do the same thing to some of the top politicians in the country. So it's possible, they'll provide room for you to be a, a mayor or a state senator, uh, something like that, but at the same time you get co-opted. And that co-optation is handled this way. Uh, uh, a given legislator begins to argue inside the seats of Congress for a specific bill. The bill gets passed, but he doesn't have any power to implement the law that just got passed. Only the people who control this country can implement that. So when we started organizing for uh, voter registration campaigns, and uh, they started in, in, uh, in some of the counties, it was easy, a little easier to get black people uh, to register to vote. That is, they weren't being killed. They might get jailed or beaten, but they weren't getting killed. Then after they got the vote, there was nobody to vote for. Then they began to put out people to vote for. Now they got one legislator in Mississippi. But he is, is, is screaming into the wind. He's, he can yell and scream, and that's his job. That's his role. He can yell and scream, or he can keep black people down. That's the end. That's the absolute end of, uh, of his own power. And even if even if uh, half the legislator and legislators in, uh, in Mississippi were, were black, the, the final question that has to be raised is who are they responsible to? Are they responsible to the community, black community, that is black people, or are they responsible to the white nation? And there is a fundamental split between the two in terms of direction, concept, philosophy, uh, everything about that. There the are two worlds that exist here, as Du Bois said uh, uh, 65 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're entirely two different worlds, and they just white power cannot exist in the same place at the same time as a developing black power. It can't take place. You used a, a, a phrase that may not be familiar to most people. You said that, you know, that America is a fascist state. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the implications of what we've been discussing is that not only have the attitudes of white students been changing and their experience dictates a, a new look at the country in which they are born, but that the attitude of, of white America has changed also. That the earlier shot that we saw of people protesting in North Carolina, where the police were es essentially adopting a kind of custodial role, where people were arrested, but now people, and students especially, uh, are not simply being arrested, they're being killed. That's black students. Black students. That's not what, see, the, the one key, f key understanding is that in Chicago, if, white stu if black students have been on those streets, they'd have been mowed down with machine guns. Now that's, to me, that, uh, that speaks to a fundamental difference. So white students got beat in the face or stomped or kicked, and that shows the brutality and it raised the ire of the liberals and the nation, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, two or three hundred black people have been killed openly, outright, in this country in the last few years. Uh, just being on the streets, just being, uh, just being around the streets. So that, 
that, that you have to understand that. The other thing about white students is that even if they are radical or revolutionary, the only thing the white folks can do in this country so far as I'm concerned is give up power. And the only role that white students have uh, uh, along those lines is to find a way to help white folks to give up power. I'd like to say something, if I, if I may, uh, brother, on that. And that, a, a number of things that you said, and I think about when you ask about uh, why, how do we get people to understand, convey the idea that, that the vote isn't at all very valid or very valuable, having the vote. Take, I come from New York, and my parents, when they voted, have voted almost for one party, it's been the Democratic Party. And Mayor, Dale, uh, Mayor Wagner at that time ruled for about uh, 12 years in the city. And for 12 years, black people voted for him. And the ghettos have only gotten bigger. <coughs> the problems of black people in Bethlehem, South Jamaica, uh, in Harlem haven't changed. You can go to Chicago where Mayor Daly is. It's the same kind of thing. And black people are no more safe on the streets from police and from other white mobs than they were before. And, uh, and I think we begin to start seeing that during the last political campaign for presidency, you had a man like Wallace who had done everything a few years ago to violate the law, you see, to, dis to, to show disrespect for the law, now becomes a major exponent of law and order. And white folks tell black folks that we are a nation ruled by law. And uh, one of the other candidates says the first civil right is to be safe in the streets and in your home. And black people only ask to be safe in their streets and in, in, in the streets and in, their, in the home. And they begin to see rather strange how a man who has violated all of the major laws, the, the presidency, the Supreme Court, can even begin to run for presidency and even set an idea that all the rest of them take up. Um, so I think this is where we begin to start seeing very clearly that the, the vote does not work for black people. And I think as, as Brother James here has said, um, I think that's what he means by fascism. Uh, white kids would uh, go down and riot at Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They'll riot at many campuses and the police close off the town and leave them alone. They go up to Newport and they riot. But yet and so when it comes to black students just simply uh, asking for something or one kid chucks a brick through a window because this guy has charged his mother too much for bread, that child gets shot. And that's what we mean by fascism and the people on the basis, m masses understand it. And I think that Malcolm was very important here when he said, responsible to who? <coughs> If you're going to be a political representative or a politician, who are you responsible to? And most of the past black political po politicians have not been responsible to black people. They've been responsible to the political organizations they join. Uh, well, about, uh, well, reflecting uh, evidence, that is evidence of the, the radical change in response to black demonstrators and sit-inners and the like. We can all look at the massacre at Orangeburg uh, black students there using the old techniques of the student movement sitting in wanting to use the bowling alley a public accommodation and this was definitely the emphasis of the old student movement being mowed down uh, sh being shot dead a number of three I think yeah. shot dead uh, another evidence of uh, the impotency of, of having the right to vote and, and not really being able to exercise it uh, can be exemplified in, in, say, the rural South, where uh, the, the old black people on the new kinds of plantations, uh, sh tenant farms and sharecropping places, uh, are ready to go and exercise this right, which they think uh, is the next best thing to learning how to read. Uh, they go there, and, and then the master on the plantation says, you vote and you're off this land. You know, this was a uh, partially the reason for uh, so much trouble in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. So voting, or they, at least some kind of political power, must have some kind of economic strength backing it, too. And this is one of the, or this was not emphasized at all in the old student movement. Uh, and a political base, an ec well, the political base to some extent through the voting right, but an economic base, no. It, the, the, the emphasis in the old student movement was pu public accommodations and, and voter registration. And now young blacks are thinking about what is a grassroots black economic base. Yeah, but I, I, think think that well, I think there are two basic changes here. One is that there's a tactical difference. Um, in 1960 and, and in the earlier movement in Greensboro, for example, um, demonstrations were largely symbolic and largely nonviolent, or at least that's, and the, um, I think, Part of the reason for the change in attitude, both in terms of police conduct and general public opinion, is that it's a different thing.
to have a picket line and to occupy a building and say you will have to forcibly remove me, as happened at Howard in Columbia and a number of other places. And the reason that, that there's been an evolution in tactics, I think, is that um, black students, particularly, have increasingly seen that there isn't simply a, it isn't simply a question of appealing to the morality of a benevolent white master. That is, that you know you have to really use force in order to get what you want. There's no question of, of people realizing the um, the validity, the historical and moral validity of your demands, and then granting them. And I think that you know that that creates an entire change in atmosphere, an entire change in attitude. I was just saying that I in the at least in the South there were there have been attempts to develop cooperative economic basis, poor people's corporation in Mississippi, for example, is one. They've been uh, they've tried to develop uh, co-ops and uh, food processing co-ops in Alabama and South Georgia for the last five, six, seven years. Uh, one of the one of the more closely related ideas of the vote was geared toward people who wanted to uh, get on some of these boards that decided. Uh, how much cotton could be raised or how much corn could be raised in the South. And that was more close to the people, and especially in the rural areas. So there have been attempts toward cooperative development since I've been in the movement, in the, uh, since I was in the movement in the South. Uh, but I tell you that there's, uh, th this country is capitalist, and it's monopoly capitalist. That's very simple. And that's just so far you're going to be able to get. What the first thing they did was, uh, first thing that was done was that if you started to set up your own uh, storage depots, they'd burn it down. It'd be very simple. If you get voted on to a board or something, you, just, you, just may, you might get shot, you might be killed. Um, so that, because there were no real alliances between the southern rural movement and the southern urban, or in fact the northern urban uh, things that were going on. Core was doing one thing in the north, and SNCC was doing another thing in the south. Uh, could I just say one thing, and that is that I think that what, you, what this brother, brother raised before was that people, by going through these experiences that you mentioned, James, sh should prove to them that the ideas that they had about America was false, mm -hmm. that America is false, that America is false about the things it says it wants to do for its people, that it's not about, that police are not to protect black people, it's to contain them, it's to make sure that they don't do things to harm the property. The other thing is I think that we're no longer interested in confronting white people to see if they would change their hearts and they would like us, but to confront blacks to see about doing for ourselves. I think that <laughs> what the black students are telling us is that in any movement of a people to be free, the first right that they claim is the right to define their own reality. I think the sound that we are hearing in the country today is the sound of American myth shattering. Black Heritage, a history of Afro-Americans presented in association with Columbia University. Today's topic, new roles for black students. Today's discussion, reflections of the old student movement. Guest panelists were James Garrett, James Turner, Linda Hush, and Ray Brown. William Strickland, writer, lecturer, and former director of the Northern Student Movement, was moderator.